Students, I think, would benefit from choosing Spark because it gives them an opportunity to get involved at a more hands-on level earlier in their career. Students choosing to come to Spark benefit from having opportunities at the freshman and sophomore level to get involved in research that can carry them forward in their career while still maintaining the same academic rigor as they would experience at, at a four-year institution. The day in the classroom in physics and engineering starts out as sort of a conversational approach to the material that we're looking at, whether it be solving rocket science problems, whether it be designing bridges, whether it be designing electrical circuit systems. It's usually a conversational approach that leads to a lot of questions. I always tell students if they're doing science well, they'll always leave science class with more questions than they got answers to begin with. And that's to drive the intellectual curiosity of the students. And that's what I try to do, making things as interactive as possible and letting them foster that curiosity and develop those critical thinking and teamwork skills that they need to succeed as they go forward. You're dealing with a class in physics that is typically between 10 and 20 students. That gives you plenty of time to interact, ask questions. You get more direct responses from the instructor. And SWAC being a small enough school, there are instructors that you will see a number of times. So you get to develop sort of a rapport with your instructors and truly do become more like mentors than they do become teachers. The biggest thing it brings is a sense of opportunity. It gives us a chance to revisit how our curriculum works. It gives us a chance to incorporate new ideas, new equipment, and it also provides the students with ample opportunity for new projects and new developments in terms of research. The physics and engineering programs at Southwestern are a great way to begin your journey in a professional STEM career. Welcome everybody and thanks for joining us for for this month's um, Southwestern Physics and Astronomy Lecture. Um, we're always glad to have everybody um, tuned in via the live stream. Um, glad everybody could could join us. Today we're gonna, going to have an opportunity to um, discuss um, one, one of the um, more recent breakthroughs in observational astronomy that um, I believe has set a number of potential frontiers for, for study in the uh, discovery of gravitational waves that were long predicted, but we finally had the ability to actually observe them. And we actually are joined today and we'll be joined by one of the, uh, the co-discoverers of gravitational waves uh, in today's lecture in Dr. Raymond Fry at the University of Oregon. Uh, before we get to the lecture, I do want to um, kind of uh, give you guys a little bit of a brief recap of what's going on here here on campus. We uh, recently um, have started work with our our Spear research team, which is our space physics and uh, space physics engineering and atmosphere and atmospheric research team. We have uh, nine students and a research mentor um, uh, Crystal Hopper that that lead that helps to lead our research team doing research in micrometeorites um, ast uh, asteroid observations through the Isaac program and we recently have developed a few more projects uh, including some interplanetary modeling of the solar interplanetary environment uh, that I will be collaborating with students and with colleagues of mine at Southwest Research uh, due to some recent Oregon Space Grant funding that, that came across this week. We're happy to have students involved and we'd love to have more students come and join the team. You can actually contact me uh, through, through the school if you're interested and we can usually find, some, find a place for you to get started on your research career. Um, in addition, um, coming in the next few months, we'll be how, or hosting our our usual um, our annual STEM student art project uh, exhibit, which focused last year on military connections to to scientific advancements, and we'll be hosting that in uh, most likely in the new Umpqua uh, Hall. Uh, uh, 
Health and Science Building um, beginning probably in January. Uh, we still have to finalize the dates, but more information on that forthcoming. Um, that's our departmental update. Um, but to the, for the reason you guys are you guys are here today, uh, we are happy to have Dr. Raymond Fry of the University of a professor of physics at the University of Oregon, um, former department chair of the of the physics department at U of O, um, and member of the U of O's uh, LIGO research team that that was one of the teams that uh, responsible for the discovery in 2015 of gravitational waves and the first observational evidence thereof. Um, Dr. Fry got his PhD from uh, California Riverside um, back in 1984 and has been involved in high energy physics and and observational astro and observational astronomy and high energy astronomy uh, since then with over 800 uh, refereed publications. So uh, I look for. I hope you guys will enjoy. I definitely look forward to this talk because there's a lot about gravitational waves I still don't completely understand. So I'm looking forward to this one and I hope you guys are too. And without further ado, uh, I'll turn it over to Dr. Fry. Thank you very much, Aaron. It's, uh, uh, thank you very much for the invitation. Um, I wish I could be there in person this time. Uh, I always enjoy um, hiking around the dunes and whatnot going in, in your area. Um, so yeah, so let me um, tell you a little bit of, of the story of the gravitational waves. Um, and I call it the new astronomy um, because, you know, that's what it is. It's, we're sort of the new kid on the block. Um, and, you know, we can observe the universe in a new way. And um, I think what I'd like to do is spend a bit of time talking about the initial um, discoveries um, that Aaron mentioned uh, starting in um, 2015, 16, and then in 17, and, um, and then give updates about what's happened since then and where we're going in the future. Um, so, and uh, we had a small technical issue, so uh, Dallas is going to be uh, handling the slides for me. So, uh, so uh, yeah, next slide, please. So uh, let me just start by, you know, there's, there's two of our fundamental forces in nature that um, traverse the entire universe, electromagnetism and, and gravity. And um, in the case of electromagnetism, of course, this, the, the prediction of electromagnetic waves was, was made by Maxwell. Um, and in the case of uh, gravity, general relativity described it in a, a very different kind of wave, in um, a wave that involves ripples in, in space-time itself. Um, and that went along with Einstein's vision of, of, you know, gravity as being a manifestation of the structure of space and time itself. So about a year after Einstein's theory first came out in, in its more or less final form, um, he wrote a paper predicting gravitational waves. And it, it was it's interesting that it was essentially 100 years later exactly <laughs> that we actually had the capabilities finally to observe those. So what I have here in the, the right-hand little graphic is um, uh, so these are the ripples in space-time uh, propagating out from uh, a binary black hole system, which as you'll see is sort of one of our favorite uh, uh, objects in, that we observe. Um, so those are orbiting around each other and they'll eventually merge. And as they do, they produce these ripples in space-time that are propagating outward at, at the speed of light. And We've actually tested that uh, speed of light, uh, for example, and we'll get into that a little bit. Next slide, please. Okay, so um, just in a nutshell, how how does how do we? So I'm a member of the LIGO 
collaboration. It's called the LIGO Scientific Collaboration. And um, the way it works, so on the left-hand side here, we have this uh, binary black hole, like I mentioned. On the right, we have a depiction, sort of a cartoon of LIGO, which is an interferometer. And um, what's shown there in green is the deformation in space due to a gravitational wave that's coming down onto our observatory from above. And uh, as you probably know, interferometry itself is very sensitive. And it turns out that it's really nicely matched to the effect of a gravitational wave. And if you can see the, 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 the green there, um, what gravitational wave will do as it propagates inward towards our detector is it will stretch space in one direction uh, while uh, compressing it in the other dimension um, and then vice versa. And those will oscillate back and forth. And those produce a phase change in the interferometer arms um, that we can observe. And the way that works is that the interferometer arms, the ends are actually mirrors that are suspended. And so in that direction of motion along the axis, the mirrors are free falling masses in the relativistic sense. And the space is actually compressed or expanded in the distance between those mirrors. And that's what we observe as a phase change. Um, and there's a little bit at the bottom there where uh, you see what has to happen in terms of sensitivity for us to detect gravitational waves. So um, the, um, the theory of gravitational waves is in terms of a field H, which is basically the analog of say the electric or magnetic field in the case of electromagnetism, it, it comes into the mathematics the same way. And it involves a delta L over L where delta L would be the stretching or compression of the arms that I mentioned divided by L, the length of the arms. And so, you know, H is what nature gives us and delta L is what we can measure. So it behooves us to make L as large as practically possible, you know, given technology and money and so forth. Um, and even so, as you'll see in a moment, the arms of LIGO are four kilometers, that's the big L. Um, the delta L we have to measure is something like 10 to the minus 19 meters in order to measure gravitational waves. And I should remind you that the diameter of a proton is about 10 to the minus 15 meters. So it's, it's really, um, you know, incredibly sensitive. And that's why it took 100 years to, for this to happen. Next slide, please. So here's an aerial photo of the LIGO Hanford Observatory up near the Tri-Cities in South Central Washington. Um, in this photo, the uh, Columbia River is way back in the background, um, sort of where those buildings in the distance are. And then it circles around um, and it comes back uh, right to left and heads towards Portland. Um, and you can see here the interferometer arms um, well, one of them you can see the full length of, and the other one you can see partially. Um, the building at where the two arms come together is sort of where all the action is in some sense. That's where the laser that produces the light is. That's where the beam splitter is that splits the beam into the interferometer arms. And, um, and where the light comes, where we detect the uh, interference pattern coming out from that. Uh, next slide, please. Here's just a little video to show, you know, how the interferometer works. If, and especially if you're not familiar with interferometry, this might be helpful. So Dallas, I don't know, can you start the, the animation here? Yeah, there we go. So at first it just shows what happens. You see light and dark coming out of, out of the beam splitter on the lower right. And that's sort of our measurement. And then this shows um, the wave pattern itself. And so, you know, when the waves come back together, 
um, the fields at the beam splitter if uh, you can have destructive or constructive interference giving light or dark. And, um, and so that when the uh, space is compressed or expanded in the arms, as we're, you're seeing now, that interference pattern then is modulated. And the way that we do this in practice, there's a lot of details here that, of course, this cartoon isn't showing. But um, we actually sit on um, uh, destructive interference and weigh into it. So, and, you know, it's like turning the gain way up so that just the slightest amount of light will make a big signal. And so we're, in that way, we're very sensitive to changes in the interferometer arm lengths. Um, the mirrors at the ends and the beam splitter and all of that are suspended. The whole thing is in vacuum. Um, you know, basically everything you can think of can affect our measurement. And we try our best to isolate ourselves completely from the environment. And I'll talk a little bit of, about that in a minute. Uh, one other small detail, the arms of the interferometer, not shown here in the cartoon, are actually um, cavities that and the, the light bounces back and forth about 100 times in the arms. And that effectively increases the length of the arms in terms of our sensitivity. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, here's a few photos. The one on the top left is more or less what you saw before. Just, you can see both arms now. Um, on the top right is when it was under construction. This is actually at the Louisiana site. Maybe we skip to the bottom left here real quick. And we have two LIGO interferometers and they're 3000 kilometers apart. The other one is near Baton Rouge, Louisiana, right? And the time of flight, um, uh, time between those two interferometers is 10 milliseconds, which is, you know, a, a pretty long time in terms of measurement. And so we use that to our advantage. And it also means that, um, you know, environmental disturbances at one site are not going to affect the other site. Um, there's very few exceptions, and we can talk about those if you're interested. Um, and so going back to the top right, um, that's the, the vacuum tube. It's about a meter in diameter in which the laser light lives. Um, it's a nanotor vacuum. It's really a high, it's maybe the world's high, uh, largest ultra high vacuum system. And then there's concrete shields put around it to protect it from, you know, people firing rifles and driving into it and all sorts of things. Um, on the bottom right is um, in the central building, the that central tank there is the, where the beam splitter lives. And um, it's all on suspended, suspended away from uh, the earth um, and isolated from the earth. And then those other two tanks are the mirrors at the ends of the arms. Uh, and then of course there's mirrors at the far ends of the arms too, which you can't see here. Next slide, please. Okay, so I started working on LIGO in about the year 2000. Um, as Aaron mentioned, I started off doing high energy physics. And to me, this was like more fundamental physics with emphasis on the fun. <laughs> and, um, and, and so I, I worked on it for about 10 years and we started really getting serious about increasing the sensitivity of the instrument about that time. And we had a, a program of upgrades called Advanced LIGO and we had just basically finished that and we're starting an observing run in the middle of September, 2015. And we sort of turned it on. And the first thing that happened more or less was we saw a signal. And um, what you see in these two uh, 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 images on the, uh, let's just start on the left. So we Fourier transform our data as it comes in and so we get a frequency de decomposition as well as the time information. And then what you see in the images is sort of a heat map, the amplitude of signal um, that comes out of our interferometer for each pixel in frequency and time. Okay. And you can probably see there's a sort of a wispy background noise everywhere in both images, which is just our regular noise like any instrument has noise. 
But on top of that, you'll see these sort of terp-like things. We call them terps because as time goes on, they increase in frequency. Um, and we'll see why that is in a minute if you don't know already. And what's interesting, of course, is that both of these signals at the two interferometers basically look almost the same. One is a little brighter than the other because of the um, sensitivity of the instrument and also the location of the source. Um, and, um, you know, we had, of course, studied simulated astrophysical signals. And this happened, as it says at the top there, at about 3 a.m. in the middle of the night, our time. And we have, have a normal group meeting at 8 a.m. on Mondays. And this, is, we, this came up, and we said, oh, it's a merger of two black holes, because <laughs> it looks exactly like what we had thought those should look like, and a pretty loud one at that. And as we'll see, so this was, you know, um, evidence then of the first observation of gravitational waves and also the first direct observation of black holes because uh, uh, before this, they'd only been observed indirectly through um, their effect on other things. Um, so we called this uh, gravitational wave 1509-14 for the date. Next slide, please. So, okay, so here's a little bit of a, a cartoon showing about that, what that signal, um, the chirp signal looks like and its morphology, if you'd like. So on the top, you see the two black holes and uh, they're orbiting each other. They're in a binary system and they're losing energy due to the emission of gravitational waves. And so the orbit is decaying. And as they come together, um, they emit more gravitational waves. And of course, just by Kepler's law, they're also orbiting more rapidly. Um, and so the frequency of the signal increases as they come together. And so does the amplitude because the gravitational field, if you'd like, is getting stronger as they approach each other. And then they merge. And then the black hole, it forms a bigger black hole. And that de-excites for a short amount of time called a ring down. And um, that's what these signals look like in these binary systems. And they're very strong emitters of gravitational waves, these binary, compact binary mergers. And that's our primary target. Of course, we're looking for other things too, but uh, that's the kind of signal we typically see. Um, you can see here on the time axis that the time for this event, you know, is pretty short. And we'll see an event later of a uh, merger of two uh, neutron stars that is much more stretched out in time. Next slide, please. Um, just a quick note on what we did at Oregon as part of this. Our responsibility um, was to understand everything that's coming into our, that's coming into our signal that's not gravitational waves. So everything in the environment, characterizing it, quantifying it, understanding it. And then this was crucial, of course, at the time of discovery, because, um, you know, this was, you know, something that the world was taking notice of and they're everyone's skeptical. And, you know, did you think of this? Did you think of that? Why couldn't it be a lightning strike in Oklahoma or, you know, everything you can think of that might people might wonder about. But we were prepared for that. And um, what this picture shows is um, looking down on the Hanford interferometer. And so all those circles are vacuum tanks and the tubes are, so the laser is coming in from the left uh, to the beam splitter, sort of in the center, lo lower left, um, and then getting split up and so forth. Um, and um, the legend there shows some of the instrumentation that we keep for measuring the environment. And of course, this is scattered around everywhere in the interferometer as well. But you'll see magnetometers, accelerometers, microphones, cosmic ray detectors, radial frequency detectors, weather, you know, you name it. And um, next slide, please. The way we quantify this is we inject signals into the interferometer. On the top right, those red spikes are uh, magnetic field injections and it's being measured with a magnetometer that's 
one of those right next to the interferometer. And then we, if we inject those loud enough, then they'll actually show up in the gravitational wave signal, which is the middle one. You can see little red spikes sticking up there out of our noise distribution. This is basically noise as a function of frequency. And so by comparing then those two things, we know exactly how much magnetic field would produce um, some pseudo, some apparent displacement in uh, the interferometer. So that's what we call a coupling. And so then, um, you know, when we have a, a candidate gravitational wave detection, we look at all of the measurements then of the magnetic field at that time, and we say, are any of them strong enough to produce a signal in the interferometer? And, you know, typically the answer is no, <laughs> because we were careful. And, you know, and of course, that was the case also for the first detection. And so we have this kind of a enterprise that we do for all kinds of all of the other environmental signals as well, um, you know, uh, sound waves, ground motion, et cetera. Next slide, please. OK, so here's sort of a nice uh, animation. I don't know if you've seen this before, but um, imagine that you're in a rocket uh, watching these two black holes merging and you know just watch the distortion of space behind as evidenced by what happens to the stars behind um, it's really pretty amazing and this is very a uh, realistic simulation done using general relativity um, i might mention in a few minutes that um, kip thorne who um, has been part of our enterprise forever. So there's the big black hole that forms at the end and it slowly rings down and de-excites. De um, uh, he actually uh, was uh, a strong advisor in the movie Interstellar and he used the power of their animations to actually learn some new things about general relativity, um, which was sort of fun. Okay, uh, next slide, please. Okay, so um, a, a few other things about this first discovery. Um, so general relativity predicted gravitational waves. We saw gravitational waves, so check there. The other thing is that the waveforms that we use, we sort of do a lot of these as a templated search. So we assume a certain kind of model um, depending on the mass of the black holes and so forth and their spins and whatnot. And we run a whole bunch of those against the data, and then we find the one that is really close. And we use the same one at both interferometers then. And, and th that waveform fits the data really well. And if you subtract one from the other, you're just left with Gaussian noise. And so that's a test we continue to do with all of our data as we've moved on. So general relativity seems to work really well in this strong field regime, which is had not been really tested before this, okay? So this is all very new. And this slide just shows a, a couple of things. In the, in the green, the, the relative velocity of the black holes, and on the right, the curve ends because that's where merger happens. And they're approaching 60% of the speed of light. You know, it's, a, it's sort of, a, it's an extreme system, right? And it's a really good test of relativity. The black curve shows their separation, which you know ends at about one, well, in this case, about one and a half Schwarzschild uh, radii, right? Because it's two objects. Uh, Schwarzschild radii, if you don't know, is essentially what people call the event horizon. Okay, so, okay, so next slide, please. Here's some um, parameters from that first discovery. So by using the right waveform, matching that on, those waveforms have encoded in them a lot of information, as much information as is possible. Um, and so we can measure the masses and spins and all of that. So the two uh, black holes had masses of about 36 and 29 solar masses. The final black hole had a mass of 62 and if you look at those numbers, there was some mass that went away. Um, and if you look at the bottom there, three solar masses um, turned into energy in that merger. 
Um, so that's like if you had a, um, a one and a half solar mass object with matter and a one, another one and a half solar mass object of antimatter, and you brought them together and all of that went into energy. I mean, it's a tremendous amount of energy. And, you know, gravitational waves, they're just, it's, uh, space is, is strong, uh, it, it's stiff, put it that way. Um, so a lot of energy produces just these tiny wiggles by the time it gets to us. Um, okay, next slide. Oh, I, maybe before you do that, I just point out the spin there and uh, so, and the distance to this, to this object, 410 megaparsecs. So about a billion light years, a little more than that. Um, okay. Next slide, please. Um, so, you know, this was a big deal. And these gentlemen who had been working on the project much longer than I had uh, received the Nobel Prize in 2017. Um, so Barry Barish, Kip Thorne, and Ray Weiss. I mentioned Kip Thorne before. Ray Weiss was sort of the guy who really dreamed up the, the scheme for gravitational wave interferometers and quantified how the noise uh, and everything made sense. Um, and then we actually had two breakthroughs years in a row, 2016 and 17. I'll talk about 17 now. Um, so, which is a very different kind of thing. Uh, next slide, please. So yeah, I call it boom two. So 2017, we had the merger of two neutron stars and What's different, of course, about neutron stars is there's no event horizon. And so that means that they can be observed electromagnetically as well as in gravitational waves. And boy, were they. Uh, next slide, please. So just a word about neutron stars. They're, they exist. They're pretty mysterious. We still are trying to learn about them. Um, you know, they're the end products of stellar evolution in sort of the 80 to 40 solar mass uh, range. Um, it, it, they result from um, type 2 supernova, from stars that were in that mass range. And the remnant neutron star is in the range of about one to three solar masses. Um, they're about 10 kilometers across in radius. And they're basically nuclear density. If you look at that little cutaway there, uh, on average, they're nuclear density. But interestingly enough, if you go to the core, they're at least a couple of times bigger than nuclear density. And we don't know what that, ex what that is, right? This is like one of our only ways that we can study matter at this kind of density. And so we're trying to get there. Um, there's a couple of other numbers there that are sort of interesting. The, you know, G, uh, the gravitational field or the acceleration due to gravity at the surface, instead of being 9.8 meters per second squared, it's 2 trillion um, meters per second square. Incredibly strong fields. And, um, you know, a mountain on a neutron star, we're talking about a millimeter would be a huge mountain. Um, okay, next slide, please. Okay, so here's a little cartoon, some stop action of, of a simulation of these two neutron stars coming together. It's not really a simulation, it's more of a cartoon. But on the top left, number one, the neutron stars, even though they're incredibly stiff and dense, this, that extreme gravity, they're deforming, tidally deforming each other as they get close. And then in two, the next thing that happens is a gamma ray burst is produced. And this... It had been theorized, hypothesized that short gamma ray bursts, they're called, uh, result from the merger of neutron stars, binary neutron stars like this. And this was the first real evidence for that confirmation, I, I would say. Um, and that's what's shown in, in number two is these relativistic jets of particles coming out. And slide uh, number three, sorry, is the, the matter from the neutron star. So it remembers all that nuclear matter in it, and then it's coming together. And that turns out to be really an interesting thing as well. So next slide, please. Okay, so I'm, I'm gonna have a few slides with a little vignette on 
sort of things that we learn from this one event. And it really spans a broad range of, of topics. So one was just fundamental physics. How do we know that gravitational waves propagate at sea? That's what general relativity says, but who knows? And so um, in this view graph, you'll see signals versus time. On the bottom one, it shows our gravitational wave signal from um, the binary neutron star CHIRP. And you can see that that extends way past 10 seconds before the merger, which happens at zero on this plot. And that's because the neutron stars are much smaller than those big black holes we talked about initially. And so it takes them longer to actually merge and they're producing gravitational waves in that time. And so the merger happens at zero. And then this gamma ray burst was actually detected by the Fermi satellite uh, about 1.7 seconds later. And you can see that signal there. And so the distance to this source is about 140 million light years. And those signals came in separated by 1.7 seconds. Next slide. And so you can do a little calculation then. Okay, what are what's contributing to that time difference? Well, there's an astrophysical piece, and that has to do with the fact that initially the gamma ray burst is created by particles that are not light. So they're relativistic, but they're traveling a little bit slower than C. And if you put in numbers, something like 1.5, seven seconds is totally reasonable. It's more or less what people had expected. And then there's a term that would be due to a difference in propagation speed of gravitational waves relative to C, regular C. So CG would be the gravitational wave speed. Um, and so saying that the 1.7 is reasonable for astrophysics, then you can place constraints on the propagation speed of gravitational waves at about you know a few parts in 10 to the 15. So that was the first direct test of you know the speed of gravitational waves, if you like the speed of gravity. And you know, as we get more sources like that, we can confirm that that astrophysical piece is, is reasonable and so forth. Next slide. Okay, so then. What happens next is interesting. So on the left here, you see a simulation. This is a real simulation now of two neutron stars coming together and they're tidally deforming each other. And then they come together and spray stuff out. And all this nuclear matter goes out into space. Um, the stiffness of the neutron star actually affects the waveform that we see in gravitational waves. So we can start to measure the equation of state of the neutron star, how, what it's made out of. And we've made some progress there, <laughs> but we're, we'd like to do more. Um, and then all this stuff goes out into space. There's a, um, basically a supernova-like afterglow that occurs called a kilonova. And this was predicted, but it had not been observed before this as well. Next slide. Okay, so people with telescopes needed to know where to look. So if you look at this, uh, this sky uh, view on the left here, you'll see a green splotch that says LIGO. And at this point, we had our friends in Europe with the Virgo gravitational wave interferometer also join the party. They're not as sensitive as us, but they were sensitive enough to constrain the position on the sky to the darker green little oval there. And that was good enough for people with telescopes to look in that part of the sky and see if they found a glowing object. And they did. And um, so on the right-hand side, the lower one shows an archival view of this galaxy, NGC 4993. And in the crosshairs, there's no object. And, and at the time, well, a few hours after we detected the event, they saw this glowing object appear in the crosshairs. And this was the kilonova, and it lasted for days in the visual, in the optical. And 
in the radio, it lasted for, well, it's a year, more than a year, it turns out. Um, the offset of, the, um, of that little splotch, the kilonova from the galaxy is typical of the fact that uh, both of those neutron stars came from resulting from supernova explosions and they each kick that binary and it's normal for them to be kicked out that far from a galaxy after a certain amount of time. Next slide, please. So everyone got into the party. It was probably the most observed event in the history of astronomy. I think when um, we, we sort of coordinated the release of papers and I think you know something like 60 papers hit the Astrophysical Journal in one day and all of the little blue dots represent observations out, you know, besides ours. Um, there's even one in Ar Antarctica, high energy neutrinos using ice cube and the, the telescopes in space and, and whatnot. Uh, so it was a big party. Next, next slide, please. Uh, here's a couple of examples. Uh, on the left is from Hubble. Uh, you can see the, the kilonova afterglow there. And on the right is an X-rays from Chandra. Next slide. Um, so here's sort of a fun thing. And um, so let's do, let's just talk about nuclear physics for just a moment here. So what you see here is proton number of a nucleus versus neutron number. And the black um, that you see there represents what's often called the island of stability. This is the combination of neutrons and protons that produce stable nuclei. Okay. And um, this is actually an animation. And you see the colored bits at the bottom there. That, those represent what we think neutron stars are made out of, more or less. They have, you know, sort of neutrons, of course, and protons, but also chunks of nuclear matter. And um, so those go out into space. And normally, if you just bring a couple of unstable nuclei together and make a heavier nuclei, it's not going to be near the island of stability, and it just decays right away. But if you keep pumping neutrons at it and bits of nuclear matter, it will glom those on before it has a chance to decay. And that's what happens here. This is called the R process. It had been theorized, hypothesized, but this was the first confirmation. In Dallas, if you can run the animation, people can see. Okay, so you, this is all happening in, you can see the time evolution at the top. We're talking milliseconds to seconds and all this stuff. And eventually stuff reaches the island of stability and it gloms on there. And we've got new heavy nuclear nuclei formed. Next slide, please. So, the upshot is that we now believe that a much of our heavy elements in our bodies, in our Earth and so forth, solar system, are the result of these merging neutron stars. Um, if you look at textbooks, it will say that it's from supernova, but people were starting to already not believe that. It, the numbers didn't really quite work out. And so this is sort of our new view. We think that from... Um, for example, from this merger of neutron stars, about an Earth mass of gold was produced, <laughs> as well as other things, but that was one that the media really liked to play up. Okay, next slide. Okay, finally, um, a little bit on cosmology. Um, so if you've heard of the Hubble diagrams and so forth, they basically are a plot of distance versus redshift. And um, on the left, you see the straight line, more or less, that Hubble had, um, had found for distance versus redshift. And this is done assuming standard candles for the sources. These are supernova 1As, which are 
thought to be good replicas of standard candles. And so what's measured there is the luminosity instead of the distance, and that's why. Um, as you go out to larger redshifts, so away from our local universe, it's no longer a straight line. And the, um, it's, so the H is not a constant and it actually traces out the expansion history of the universe. And so if you look at the top right plot, um, you'll see basically that same Hubble diagram extended out to large redshift for different models for what's happening in the universe. And the data was favoring the model where we're in an accelerating expansion. And you know that's part of where that all came in from and the tie into dark energy and all of that is, this is one of the pieces of that puzzle in order to, you know, I think it's pretty important to check this stuff. And, um, and so, you know, to do this, you have to measure a distance and a redshift. Okay. And with a normal astronomy, electromagnetic astronomy, um, redshifts are fairly easy. Distances are not easy. And astronomers have to use distance ladders to figure this out. Next slide, please. And there was a big crisis that's been happening. Uh, you know, it's called a crisis in popular media, but um, this shows that, so if you extrapolate that Hubble curve back to zero redshift, that's called the Hubble constant, H naught, okay? And that represents the expansion of the universe in our current age. And there's a couple of ways of measuring it traditionally. On the right is using uh, supernova and other standard candles, Cepheid variables and so forth in our local universe. That's why it's called late, late time. The other way of doing it is to measure the really precise measurements from the, cos uh, the uh, cosmic microwave background at redshift of a thousand, and then extrapolate that to redshift of zero, assuming that we know what the hell we're talking about. And in terms of the, the physics that's going on. And they don't agree, apparently. And so this was a few years ago, it was already over four standard deviations of difference. It actually had gone, may become even a bigger discrepancy. Next slide. And you can see that in these two curves, the one on the left is the cosmic microwave background one, the one on the right is from the near universe uh, Cepheid variables and so forth. It, more than five standard deviations of separation. Wendy Friedman thinks that the um, tip of the red giant branch is a good measurement, is a good way to measure a standard uh, candle. And that's what this TRGB is, which seems to span the two. <laughs> I don't know if that's good news or bad news. To me, this whole thing is sort of exciting because it represents the possibility that um, there's some physics that we don't understand. Uh, next slide. So where does this fit in with gravitational waves? So uh, so on the top right is the image I sh showed earlier of our gravitational wave signal from merging black holes. And on the left is sort of what those signals look like mathematically. And I'm not going to get into that uh, here, but um, what you see in the prefactor on the right-hand side is that it's proportional to one over the distance. We measure the distance directly from the amplitude of these signals, which you can't do in electromagnetic uh, measurements. So that gives us a strong advantage in terms of systematics. Next slide. So we had this one event, the, the binary neutron star merger, and you know one event is not good enough to, con to tell the difference between those two things, which are the orange and the green here. And our curve is that big fat curve there, which is you know, way too wide to tell the difference. But with enough events, we'll be able to do that. Okay, next slide. We need to move along here. So, um, so that was, what we call observational run two. We started observational run three in 2019. We managed to increase the sensitivity between runs again by 1.4 cubed in terms of our rate. 
And we started putting out alerts almost in real time when we saw an event, and you could even get those on your phone now. Uh, so these are open public alerts. There's some links there. Next slide. Uh, just more of that. Next slide. And this just shows our rate, our, our numbers of detections online actually as a function of time. And you can see the slope increase as we improve the sensitivity of the detector. And, you know, we're actually up around 100 now. Next slide. So this is just sort of a nice cartoon showing all of these events. So um, I can't point here, but um, all of the blue things, they're in um, trios. So if you look closely, there's two black holes coming together to make a final black hole, okay, in each case. So those are our detections, right? There's three black holes involved each time. And the masses are on that, uh, that vertical scale there in solar masses, okay? And then you see neutron stars down below and our measurements of neutron stars, we've got a few now, none as, spect as spectacular as that first one, but uh, they're all uh, nice neutron star mergers. So, you know, like I said, we're going to have, well, next slide. In a few days, actually, we're going to release um, our catalog, which will sort of give all of the numbers for the full O3 run. And like I said, there'll be a, on the order of 100 detections in that catalog. And, you know, of course, we try and learn physics from them. What do we do? We, for black holes, we try and figure out, you know, stars uh, made the black holes. Where did the stars come from, right? Are these just the normal evolution of two massive stars in a binary system? And each one of them what made a black hole? Are they population three stars? And that's why they're so massive, you know, from the very early star formation, mostly hydrogen initially. Um, the new kid on the block sort of is that there, we have evidence that um, some of our black holes may have formed from in dense environments like globular clusters and had dynamical formation to make the binaries. Uh, a really fun idea is that these are actually primordial black holes, or some of them are. And um, this was hypothesized by Hawking, is that, you know, you can have quantum fluctuations in the early universe. Inflation expands them into black holes, and they don't have to, res they don't result from stellar evolution. So they can have any mass, okay? And maybe that's part of what dark matter is, right? So this is all sort of fun stuff. Um, neutron stars, I sort of already mentioned uh, a lot of that, so I'm not going to go through it again in the interest of time. Next slide. So um, this just gives sort of a, a depiction of, you know, things we measure from black holes. Again, we have our waveforms that match onto our signals, and there's something called the no hair, th hair theorem in relativity, which says the only things you can actually measure from a black hole intrinsically are its mass, its spin, and its electric charge, the latter of which is no value to us. Um, and so we measure those things. And of course, we measure where they are in the sky too. Next slide. So what about black hole masses? Um, so you've heard about supermassive black holes in the centers of galaxies. We don't measure those. those they're too massive for, and I can explain why if you're interested later. We measure what we call stellar mass black holes, sort of in the range of, you know, a few to a hundred-ish sort of solar masses. And sort of there's a rundown here of what masses can exist. Interestingly, if you get in this mass range, if you look at the bullet second to the bottom, in the mass range 60 to 130, Normal stellar evolution theory says that we should not have black holes in that mass range. And the reason why is that, um, you know, uh, stars, of course, are in equilibrium between gravity and radiation pressure. And those massive stars 
the photons are energetic enough to pair produce. And that reduces the radiation pressure. Gravity takes over and the whole star ends up detonating and they disappear. So there's no black hole remnant. Next slide. And this is sort of before 03, our distribution of masses, um, the vertical axis there, the black guys are the initial black holes and the red is the final black guy, uh, final uh, mass black hole. Next slide. But then we saw something in 03 that shouldn't exist. So we saw two black holes that were basically in that forbidden band, which is indicated by the gray there. So these black holes, either the theory's wrong, could be, or they form from something that's not ordinary stellar evolution. Next slide. Okay, and the other handle we have on this is spin. I'm not gonna go through all this here, but you can probably understand that if you have a normal stars and binary evolution, their spins will actually tend to align, okay? And that will be uh, manifest then in the black holes themselves. But if you have dynamical formation, so collisions of black holes in a dense environment, they come together to make a binary, those spins are gonna be random. So we're starting to have enough data now that we can piece together how these contributions are. It looks like we have contributions from both. That's the way it looks right now. Okay, next slide. What about a black hole and a neutron star? We saw two of those in 03. I'm not gonna go through this. Next slide. And there they are in that same diagram. <laughs> you can see the, the sort of uh, whitish neutron star and black hole coming together. Next slide. Um, one of the things that we're doing locally, we do a lot of data analysis is besides working on um, the instrument and trying to understand the environment. Um, magnetars is a fun one involving neutron stars. And we found a connection now between those and fast radio bursts. And we're trying to see if they make gravitational waves. So that's sort of a fun topic. Uh, next slide. So I, I'm approaching the end here and also about out of time, but I'll, I'll be quick here. Um, the near future, so I mentioned that we just finished the 03 run. If you look in this view graph, you can see numbers there, which those represent our sensitivity, how far away we could measure a binary neutron star merger. It's just sort of our standard way of measuring sensitivity. Um, as usual, we're going to improve the instruments uh, going into the next run, which is 04. Uh, and each time you improve the sensitivity in this number by a factor X, the rate increases by X cubed, right? And so, um, you know, we're going to have a lot of events, event per day, one event per day in 04. And something I'm not going to have time to talk about, we actually use um, quantum squeezing in our interferometer now to improve the sensitivity. And as far as I know, this is the only application of quantum squeezing besides laboratory demonstrations. Next slide. And this is just an interesting thing. The, this noise is so low in our detector that 20 or 40 kilogram test masses, we can measure the fact that they're in a quantum harmonic oscillator state. Okay, so that's fun. Next slide. Okay, so just one last thing here before I wrap up. You know, this, I think basically almost all regular astronomers re realize the value of gravitational waves, adding gravitational waves to the mix now. And you know, of course, we'd like to do more. And so instead of four kilometer arms, why not 40? And compared to an accelerator, this is cheap or compared to, you know, 
uh, telescopes put into space, it's, you know, 10% of those sort of costs. So why not think about that? So next slide. This just gives an indication of why that's interesting. And um, it's hard to show this without pointing, but if you look in the, from the center towards the bottom, that little pie slice, it shows redshift, okay? And where on the right-hand side are our best guesses of where binary black holes live in terms of redshift. And on the left-hand side are uh, neutron stars and where they live in redshift space and land. And um, our sensitivity for O3, for example, is that those sort of whitish lines um, towards the middle. But with a 40 or 20 or 40 kilometer arms, we can measure all the way out to the purple and the red, actually to the, to the purple, to the outside. What does that mean? We can measure all the way to the beginning of star formation, okay? This, you can't do this with electromagnetic astronomy, okay? This is the only handle, direct way of measuring that. Um, so to me, this seems very exciting and it's just like something we have to do. Okay, next slide. Um, here's people in our local group at, at the current time, um, a bunch of grad students, a uh, few faculty. Um, we're all having fun. Next slide. Here's a, a photo of some of us. Not, there's a few missing people here from this last summer um, in, in my backyard, actually. Um, and I think I, I'll wrap it up there. It's time anyway. So uh, I'm happy to answer questions. And um, if people have questions for me offline, let me just write my email in the chat here. Feel free to drop me a line um, if you have questions. Yeah, I, I will definitely share that with I'll definitely share that with the with the students and with and with anybody that reaches out to me. Um, I'm scanning through the uh, questions. Um, one one of our um, one of our faculty or one of our staff members here at, here at SWAC, uh, Ann Matthews, actually asked, um, uh, "Can you explain how the citizen science component works for for LIGO and how?" people can get more involved in, in um, getting the updates and, and other aspects of finding out what, what is going on with the LIGO discoveries? Yeah, so um, one of the, the links that I sh had there earlier was um, for something called the Gravitational Wave Open Science Center. And we release our data. We don't release it in real time yet. <laughs> Um, we still have a proprietary period where we have a chance to, you know, figure out what's in it and, you know, get all the bugs out and all that stuff before we release it to the public. But, you know, it's roughly a year after the data is taken, it, it gets released. So all of that data is available. And uh, the Open Science Center actually runs workshops for people to learn how to analyze the gravitational wave data. And um, one of the things we're also working on is um, releasing all of the environmental monitoring that we do, like here at Oregon. Um, it's, it's tricky because a lot of it is, you know, we know what's good and what's not, and it's a lot of work to, to uh, you know, call that all out um, for the public, but um, we're working on that as well. I don't know, does that answer the question? Um, I, I think it does. Um, the one thing I'll, I'll add, would it be possible for you to, send me an email with those links and I can share it. Oh, with sure. Them, yeah. And I can share it with Absolutely. those who are interested. Uh, and um, I'm happy to, to, you know, if you have a place to put the slides, that's fine too. I'm happy to share I, those. I, I, I think, I, I think I do somewhere. I'll, I'll have to figure that out. I uh, had one of my, one of my students, uh, Jake Bullard actually asked, he's interested in knowing why uh, the supermassive black holes in the centers of galaxies are, you, you said they're too massive to measure. I was he was curious yeah. as to what the limitations were on that. Yeah, so you know we're 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 sensitive 
to these binary um, merger sort of things. And um, so if you have a really massive black hole, what happens is that they merge really quickly because they're big. They, then they merge at a frequency of detection that's at very low frequencies. And we're stuck on the Earth where at low frequency, the Earth is shaking and, and it's shaking so badly that nothing we can do will prevent it, will allow us to make detections there. So we can't really, practically, it's hard to get below about 10 Hertz. And so um, if for black holes that are above about a few hundred solar masses, we, we can't detect those anymore. Um, so there is LISA, which is a proposed space-based interferometer, gravitational wave interferometer, which doesn't have the problem of being on the Earth. And one of their targets is to measure colliding galaxies. Each one, of course, has a supermassive black hole, and those supermassive black holes will undergo the same kind of process I've talked about. And um, Lisa will be able to detect those, assuming it happens. <laughs> So I, I will throw in a couple of questions from from me. Um, one I always ask all of our all of our guest speakers uh, if we have um, students or or community members that are that are looking to get into this this realm of sort of observational astronomy and the fundamental physics that goes with it. Uh, mm -hmm. What academic preparation would you um, would you advise for for them to to take on I know some of my students are physics majors some of them are engineering majors and 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 assorted other disciplines but it looks like this yeah, so, type of physics can tie into a lot of things right yeah the um, the vast majority of, of people working on LIGO have physics degrees um, there's some engineers, of course, as well, and uh, a few people from other fields. Um, I, I think people that have some of the people that have physics degrees will call themselves astrophysicists, and I, I think most of us do that now because we're observing uh, the sky, right? <laughs> um, and so. The, the, the most common path is, is, is getting a physics degree and, um, and then learning about, you know, astronomy and astrophysics as part of that. Um, and, you know, it's not necessary. Often the students that work with me um, don't have much background in astronomy sometimes. And, um, you know, they, they sort of pick it up on the fly in, in graduate school. Um, is that does that answer yeah. your question? That, okay. that that does that does help. Um, and I guess the other the other question I have is more of a more of a question in terms of how you got involved in the in the project. You, you said you said that you you shifted to this because it seemed like it was more it was more fundamental physics and it was more um, more more fun as you put it. Um, yeah. What was the, the main catalyst to switch off to, to LIGO versus what you were doing before with uh, so, some of the high energy physics? Yeah, I just saw it as an opportunity to um, explore something that had not been explored before in nature, right? I mean, I mean it's, it's like the equivalent of, you know, operating the first accelerator, right? I mean, it's, you know, it's, it's a new way of looking at the universe. Um, and y using this new thing of gravitational waves. And so um, that definitely caught my imagination. And it, to me, it's not much different in spirit than particle physics, because they're both, you know, at their basis is sort of fundamental physics ideas. Um, I think the difference with LIGO is the O in LIGO is observatory. And so we're using the gravitational waves to do observe the universe. Um, and so that's the additional piece, which is fun because we're learning about the physics of neutron stars and, you know, how stars, where, where did they come from after all, you know, all of these things is there, are there primordial black holes that are contributing to dark matter? I mean, these are all really fun questions. 
a, lo a lot of those a lot of those are very very fun and they and I, I was an amateur astronomer for for years before I before I got to this and we always learned about interesting things that that could be possible with black holes and neutron stars that we didn't fully understand so it's always good to see these windows kind of open checking for additional questions it looks like we we don't have any more questions directly um, I know I I spoke to you a little bit before before the talk, but this is sort of an announcement for students and for faculty members that are, or community members that might be interested. Uh, you had talked about being interested in a in a potential meetup with students to discuss a little further if if we could in a couple of weeks, and mm -hmm. I will put yeah, that absolutely. together for the students and. I'm sure they will, they'll look forward to it and they'll, they'll bring more interest. They'll be bring more questions there. I'm sure they just may be processing. Okay. things. That's good. That's good. <laughs> All right. All right. I appreciate it. And th thank you again for, for doing this. And hopefully, hopefully soon we'll be, able, we'll be able to have you come down and, and do an in-person one at, at some point. <laughs> yeah. 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 There's a lot of new stuff that I didn't talk about. Right. And so that would be fun to talk about. All right. Actually, my student, Jake, asked one more question that just popped in. Okay. Um, in the in the list of scientists that are working with LIGO, he, he said he noticed that there were references to cosmic strings. And mm -hmm. he yeah. was wondering if you'd be able to expand on what those are. Uh, yeah, so uh, phase transition in the early universe um, as different as the fundamental forces sort of freeze out. And one of the possibilities is that they produce these sort of uh, boundaries in the, you know, when a phase transition happens, just like um, when you have freeze out of, of water or something. And, um, and so those are cosmic strings and then um, they can move around in space and actually collide with each other and make kinks and cusps. And when that happens, they produce bursts of gravitational waves that if they exist, we might be able to measure. So we actually do search. There's a lot of things that we search for that I didn't talk about, right? Like uh, gra uh, core collapse supernova. We search for you know gravitational waves from those. We haven't had one in our galaxy for a long time. If we did, that would be cool. Presumably we'd see that, for example. Um, cosmic strings is another example. Uh, uh, I mentioned magnetars is an example, you know, that you know, can get these neutron stars wiggling a little bit and measure gravitational waves from them. So, you know, there's a lot of those kinds of searches that we do. And they're fun projects for students as well, because they're not like right in the thick of our, our main thing. And, you know, they can sort of go off to the side a little bit and think about what they're doing and develop their own techniques and so forth. And so um, that's sort of a fun thing. All right. Well, once again, thank you very much for your time. And we hope everyone's had a, a enjoyable lecture today. And we look forward to our next uh, physics and astronomy lecture, which will be in early January. Um, more information on that coming soon.